Hello and welcome to the Atoll, your home for Waterworld fandom. In today's Collecting Deep Dive, we'll be taking a look at the Waterworld trading cards as well as the Waterworld Pogs, also known as Milk Caps. So without further ado, let's stack some cardboard and ready those slammers because in this video, we're playing for keeps. So first, let's take a look at the Waterworld Fleer Ultra trading cards, which were released in 1995 alongside the film. The Fleer Corporation actually has a long history dating back to 1885 when it became the first company to successfully manufacture bubblegum. They began making trading cards in 1923 with the production of baseball cards that included printed advertisements for their candy products on the back. Fast forward to the 1990s and Fleer was actually acquired by Marvel Entertainment Group where they began producing non-sports trading cards, a subgenre within trading cards that has its own interesting history involving the tobacco industry, but grew in popularity during the 1980s and 90s with media-based cards that showed characters, events, and behind the scenes from films and television shows. And that is exactly where the Waterworld trading cards come in. Here we have a promotional advertisement from my collection that shows some sample cards on the front complete with the foil stamping and on the back a description of the collection as a whole. So, the main collection consists of 150 cards with quote, compelling, action-packed photography, foil stamping, and UV coating. In addition to the main collection, there's also the limited edition chase cards, a total of 18 cards, or 6 cards in 3 categories, that include double foil, prismatic foil, and hologram. Interestingly, this promotional advertisement was part of a larger packet containing all sorts of marketing materials to convince card sellers at the time to buy packs in bulk for retail to consumers. And speaking of packs of cards, it seems that Fleer released Waterworld packs in two different sizes, the common 8 card pack and the far less common long 10 card pack. Cracking open the 8 card pack, we find 7 main collection cards and 1 chase card. And by the way, since I just cracked into this pack, if you direct message me on Instagram, I'll send you one of these cards as a thanks for watching the video while supplies last. Going back to the set as a whole, the main 150 card collection is actually further divided into sections which include... Number 1 is a cover card with a synopsis of the film on the back. Cards number 2 through 9 call out and describe the individual characters from the film. Cards number 10 through 116 go chronologically through the plot points of the film. Cards number 117 to 124 call out and recap the careers of the cast and filmmakers behind the production of the film. Cards number 125 through 140 give us a behind the scenes look at the film. Cards number 141 through 149 call out and describe the individual vehicles and set pieces from the film. And finally, card number 150 is a checklist of the entire collection. The individual cards themselves all have a similar format with the main image on the front oriented either horizontally or vertically with the title of the card printed on a foil stamp on the bottom. On the back side of each card is the image and the title again along with the number and a brief description of how the card fits into the film's story. The titles of individual cards range from serious to cheeky, with some of the more humorous examples being like number 46, punchline, number 55, matter of perspective, number 63, split ends, and hologram number 3, dolphin-like. Looking more closely at the overall structure of the plot point cards which make up the bulk of the collection, it seems that they follow the story laid out by the extended cut of the film with some good measure of Max Allen Collins' novelization thrown in. What I mean by this is that specific things from the extended cut deleted scenes like the Atoll Town meeting, the Mariner looking through his Nat Geos, the Slave Colony subplot, and the Mount Everest plaque are all present among the cards. And then within the writing on the cards are specifics drawn directly from the novelization. Things like the Atollers dropping jellyfish on invading smokers, Helen, Naughty Nola opening the Atoll gates to free the Trimoran, the smokers watching old war movies aboard the Ds, the smokers using tugboats to pull the Ds are just some among countless other examples. 
Interestingly, a few random scenes are missing from the main plot point cards, like the Mariner's encounter with the first Drifter or the scene where the Mariner returns to his burnt out Trimoran. But what's really going to bake your noodle about the plot point cards is that not one of them, not even a single card, shows an actual frame of film from the movie Waterworld. That's right, all the photos shown in these cards are from alternative takes with different camera angles and or different lenses than the actual shots used in the various cuts of the film. And while they may appear to have been pulled directly from the film, it even took me a while to catch on to this, I wholeheartedly can confirm that none of the images on these cards are from the final print of Waterworld. It's as if somebody came into the editing room, swept up all the unused footage off the floor, and created a card collection from it. And I really have no idea why they did it this way. Perhaps to uphold some kind of non-disclosure agreement with Universal Studios? I'm not sure, so let me know your theories down in the comments below. But beyond the plot point cards are also the behind the scenes cards, probably my favorite bunch of cards in the entire collection. These cards offer images from the production of Waterworld not published anywhere else. Some of my favorites of these cards include number 126, which shows part of the cast aboard Gregor's dirigible on a blue screen stage, number 129 which reveals a shortened version of the Bridge of the Dees that was built in studio, and number 137 which shows Kevin Costner and stunt double Norman Howe racing each other on jet skis. And I don't think I've ever mentioned this in any other video, but Norman Howe nearly died on the set of Waterworld from an embolism when surfacing too quickly during one of the underwater scenes shot off the Kona coast. He was rushed to a nearby hospital to recover in a decompression chamber and was actually back on set just a few days later. I also just want to give a quick shout out to cards number 141 through 149, which call out and describe particular vehicles and set pieces from the film, things like the Deacon Mobile, the Hellfire Gunner Boat, the Refueler Barge, and Gregor's Dirigible, to name a few. These cards inspired me to create deep dive videos on all these individual creations and help to structure the content you'll find here on this channel. Finally, the chase cards consist of three sets of six cards. First, there's the inconspicuous double foil cards, which seem to have this theme of describing the various characters' motivations in the film and are given the standard foil stamp and title at the bottom and a second foil stamp here at the top. It took me a really long time to determine what this logo is meant to represent, but I think it's supposed to be a W for Waterworld, with the number 95 below it for 1995, the year of the film's release. Let me know in the comments if you think I have this right. Second, we have the prismatic foil cards, which in theme seem to be just more moments from the film but in visuals, give us these really nice shiny cards that separate the characters from the backgrounds with different color treatments. Also, this prismatic foil card has Kevin Costner's daughter on it, who played a dead atoller in the extended cut of the film. Looking at the back of the booster packs, it actually seems that the prismatic foil cards are rarer than the other chase cards, only appearing in one in every six packs. And finally, we have the hologram cards, which are really the finest of all the chase cards. These, which sort of have a heroes and villains theme to them, use a hologram effect that really stands out, making these cards feel like an exciting and rare experience. And notice how the hero cards have this knife pattern in the holographic background, and the villain cards have this eyeball pattern. But I think I will now end my discussion on the Waterworld Fleer Ultra trading cards by looking at 10 specific cards that I find interesting, funny, or profound in some way. Starting with... Number 1. Card number 2 states that the Mariner is quote, a mutation with gills that allow him to breathe underwater, and as far as he knows, he's the only one. And this fact that the Mariner has never met another Muto according to this card has always struck me as a little strange, not to mention it throws my theory about his mother being a mutation out the window. Why I find this odd is because the Atollers seem to recognize what a mutation is, and even here on Prismatic Chase Card number 1 is a clear definition of what the Atollers mean by the word Muto. So how is it that the Mariner has never met one of his kind, yet his kind are so well known within the universe of Waterworld? Number 2. 
Card number 9 is a character card for the Smoker Doctor. I find this one strange because of what a small role this character has in the film, but in the collecting cards he is given the same billing alongside the Mariner, the Deacon, Helen, Enola, Gregor, Nord, and the Enforcer. Number 3 Card number 42 has one of the worst photographs, with this composition that places the Mariner's face under the foil stamping, making the focus of the image the brown pool of human excrement in the background. Another badly cropped photo is on the back of card number 68, which seems squarely focused on Costner's crotch. Number 4 some of the special effects were clearly not finished when the collecting cards were being created, as you can see on card number 76, which talks about swimming to the underwater city, but clearly shows the Mariner and Helen being shot against a blue screen in a water tank. Number 5 Card number 85 says that New Oasis, the small rebuilt atoll at the end of the film, is on the eastern banks and I've always wondered what is meant by that. Is the Eastern Banks a section or body of water within Waterworld, and how would the inhabitants be able to decipher it from the rest of the Endless Ocean? Number 6 I know I've already mentioned this in my deep dive on the Ds, but card number 100 has the most chilling image on it with this photo of a woman and child being engulfed in flames. This shot was definitely scrubbed from all versions of the film as it makes you really question the Mariner's choice to destroy the Ds in such a violent way with so many people aboard it. Number 7 Cards number 97 and 101 make reference to a smoker named Tron who is this guy in the film. I think he gets special recognition on the cards because he has a slightly larger role in the novelization. In fact, the novelization gives names to a bunch of the individual smokers throughout the story, like Chester and Bone here. Number 8 there's a misprint that renders the collection without card number 109. Card number 109, Lucky Shot, was accidentally printed with the back for card number 108, Help From Above, giving us two cards with the same back. Number 9. One of the behind the scenes cards, card number 117, shows Kevin Costner with his long mariner hair worn down, and as far as I know this is the only image of Costner wearing his hair this way. Number 10. And finally, card number 124 is one of the strangest in the entire set with this very formal photo of producer John Davis who, by the way, is producing the upcoming Waterworld TV series if that ever sees the light of day. But in any case, can you imagine being a little kid back in 1995 and pulling this corporate headshot out of your fresh pack of action movie cards? But all in all, I think the Waterworld Fleer Ultra trading cards are a must-have for any Waterworld collector. While writing this video, the discovery that all the images are from alternative takes and camera angles really blew my mind. It was suddenly like looking at a whole different film through the cards. So if you haven't already, I would highly recommend picking up the Waterworld trading cards for yourself. Let's now turn our attention from the Waterworld trading cards to another form of cardboard collecting, that being the Waterworld Pogs. And there is simply nothing more 90s than a big blockbuster film having a Pog collection in its name. For those that don't know, Pogs were a children's game popular around the time of Waterworld's release that involved collecting and playing with flat circular cardboard discs printed with colorful images and designs. The game of Pogs, also known as Milk Caps, is extremely simple and probably why it became so popular among school children in the 90s. Players contribute an equal number of Pogs from their collection and put them into a large stack face down. Players then take turns throwing a slammer, a heavy plastic or metal disc, onto the top of the stack, scattering and hopefully flipping some of the Pogs. Any pogs that land face up become the possession of the thrower, and the remaining face down pogs are restacked with the next player having their turn to throw the slammer and win their share of face up pogs. Play continues until the entire stack has been flipped, and the player with the most pogs is the winner. And the history of Pogs is a pretty interesting one, with the game having its origins possibly traced back to the Japanese card game Menko, which has existed since the 17th century. In more recent history, Pogs is usually cited as starting in Maui, Hawaii in the 1920s when children began playing the game with actual cardboard caps from milk bottles. 
New packaging was introduced in the 1950s that made the cardboard caps obsolete, however Hawaiian companies continued to use them as promotional items. Heliocala Dairy used the collectible caps to promote the juice drink Passion Orange Guava, aka Pog, and by the 1990s the game had been introduced to a new generation of Hawaiian elementary school students, with most accounts citing an educator named Blossom Galbizo for the reintroduction. The game's popularity spread across the Hawaiian Islands and soon hit the mainland. A businessman named Alan Rapinski seized the opportunity to create a new fad with a low-cost product and huge advertising potential and quickly trademarked the name Pog and created the World Pog Federation. By 1993, many other companies from the comic book and trading card industry had jumped on the fad and by 1995, Pogs were probably hitting their peak in popularity and this is actually around the time that the Waterworld collection was created. And turning now to that collection, we actually have two different sets of Waterworld Pogs, which I'll be calling the Official Collection and the Bootleg Collection. Starting with the Official Collection, we can see that the front of each Pog has an image from the film, and studying these more closely, we can see that many of these are the same photographs that were printed on the trading cards. Again, the images on the Waterworld Pogs are not actual frames from the film, but rather alternative takes and camera angles. Along with the images is a number on each pog, which indicates the number it is in the collection of 65 individual pogs. And on the back side of the pogs is a blue repeating pattern of the Mariner over the Waterworld logo and the copyright information under that. And I actually don't own the entire set, as you can see I only have about 15 of the total 65. But fortunately, friend of the channel CarlDude555 has sent me images of the entire set from his Waterworld collection. In my opinion, some of the standout pogs from the collection include this pair, which when put together actually look like they're from the same shot. There is also this one with a fire tornado coming off the water in the Atoll Lagoon. This is the only time I think I've ever seen this image. On this pog, there is this nice image of the Mariner and Enola sitting on the netting of the Trimoran. I'm not sure if this is a production still or an actual deleted scene from the film, but I believe it's a production still. And check out this pog where the Deacon is wearing his bicorn hat and talking to Enola. This scene is not present in any version of the film and must come from a deleted scene never shown to the public. And I actually like how the last five pogs in the collection have this kind of random graphic design thrown onto them. Pogs in general seem to lean into the sloppy graphic design, so I actually feel like this look is totally appropriate here. And very interestingly, among pog collectors, the official Waterworld pog collection is considered quite prized, or at least according to this list on 90snation.com. And I have to say, the official Waterworld pogs are quite rare to come by. I've only seen them pop up on eBay a few times over the years, so if you see these in the wild, be sure to snag them if you can. Now, let's turn to the other Waterworld Pog collection, which I have dubbed the Bootleg Collection. I cannot actually confirm that these are bootleg, but it is my hunch that with the Pog craze popping up so quickly, and the products being so cheap to create, a lot of people rushed in to create Pogs about whatever was relevant at the moment, even without getting the proper permissions or licensing. And what really clues me into these being a bootleg product is the fact that they are blank on the back, lacking the logo and copyright information like the official Waterworld Pogs. But regardless, I still find the bootleg Pogs fascinating in their own way. They display various images from the film, and on top of that, the creators of the collection have superimposed the title of the film. The title graphics are actually grabbed from the end of the teaser trailer, and this got me wondering, are all the images screen grabs from the teaser trailer? And yes, indeed, they are. Some of the standouts from the bootleg collection include the underwater survival kisses, this nice helicopter shot of the atoll with the round design filling out the circular pog perfectly, the smoker armada over rising sun, as well as an array of high quality close-ups of the main cast. Some of the more lackluster bootleg pogs include this pouty mariner, this smoky image of the atoll, and this pog with a completely blown out image of an explosion on it. And here I have 20 bootleg pogs, and I'm not sure if this is all of them or not since there's no information about this collection on the internet. 
In any case, I really enjoy the bootleg pogs, and that goes for all the Waterworld pogs in general. There's just nothing more 90s than Waterworld in pog form, and I feel these are some of my favorite items in my entire Waterworld collection. But there you have it, that is my deep dive look into the Waterworld collecting cards and pogs. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and let me know in the comments below. That kind of stuff is always greatly appreciated. And if you haven't already, subscribe to The Atoll. We have a great back library of videos and many more to come. Also, follow The Atoll on Instagram for even more Waterworld content. Link in the description below. But with that, thanks, as always, for joining me at The Atoll.